friends, I'm Mark Baker, and this is MB Today. As we get started, let me ask you a question. Did you know that God has a plan for you to walk in victory? That he has a plan for your entire life. But your will ability to walk in that plan de is determined by the place you chose to dominate your focus, your attention. What we are meditating upon, what we are thinking about, what we are considering, first and foremost in our mind, determines the story that we will live. As we get started today, let me remind you once again also that YouTube will cause our channel to rise in the search ranks based on the number of likes and subscription. So we're asking you, if God is blessing you and speaking to you these, through these programs, to please consider sharing this channel with others you might feel that you feel would be blessed by what you're hearing. Like the videos and subscribe to our channel. This will help us get the word out even further. And the more people that receive the word, the more we'll be free. And friend, we're asking you to do this as our partner and those you share the channel to that God speaks to, you'll receive a reward for that because we are partners in getting this word out together. So as we get started today, we are continuing talking about the subject the Holy Spirit has given us, the truth and the temptation. We're looking at our focus. We started looking at Mark chapter 6 in Jesus' hometown. And we saw that he was unable to do any mighty work there, save to heal a few sick folk. In the Greek, it's talking about a few minor ailments like a headache or a cold. Why? Because of the people's unbelief. Their unbelief stopped him from being able to operate in the miraculous. Their unbelief kept him from operating at the level God had desired him to operate in. Jesus had pure faith. From this, we looked at the account in Matthew chapter 17 of the boy that, you know, had a demon. The father had come to the disciples, asked them to, to free the son that they were unable to. When they asked the master why they were unable to, Jesus told them, it is not that you don't have faith, it's that you have too much unbelief. And the cure for unbelief is basically pulling the plug on unbelief. Kind of like pulling a plug in a bathtub to drain the water. How do you do that? You take time to fast. You shut down your physical body, you know, the input of your physical body. You take time to pray, to fellowship. You spend time in his presence. You fast. And when we talk about fasting, you need to use wisdom. Maybe fast a meal here or there. Maybe fast television for a few days. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you, friend. But you can shut down unbelief in your life through those two simple things that the Lord gave the disciples, fasting and prayer. But then we started looking at a storm the disciples found themselves in in Mark chapter 4. And let's go ahead and pick up in that. But before we do, I'm going to read, I, I read some um, to you in the, at the end of the last broadcast. But a word that we received in the program that aired on June 21st. Notice what the Holy Spirit tells us here about the situation with the disciples in the storm with Jesus. He said, in the storm, the disciples felt the ship was sinking, but there the master lay sound asleep. He too was in a boat filling with water. He too was in a boat that was tossed by the storms and waves, but he chose to rest in the Father's promise for the Father had given him the words to speak when he entered into that boat. Now, when you read this and we're looking at this, we've got to think of the fact that Jesus was in the same boat as the disciples. Jesus was in the same storm. Jesus was in the same sinking boat. But he had a totally different reaction. And this is what the Spirit of God is talking to us about here. He talks about the words that Jesus received from the Father. Notice what Jesus says here. In verse 35, Mark chapter 4, in verse 35, when they had sent away the multitude, they 
I apologize, verse 35, in the day, same day when the even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. So Jesus had spoken the word that he had heard from the Father, and we see this in several other chapters, such in John chapter 8, where Jesus says, you know, I only do those things my Father, that I see my Father do. I only say those things my Father says. He was totally surrendered to the Father. He was totally surrendered to the word of the Father. So when he spoke those words, let us pass over to the other side, he was able to rest in those words. I find it really interesting that he was able to sleep in a boat while it was sinking. Some of those disciples were professional fishermen. But if we take it in context of all of the other things we've looked at, we saw in the last program, Sarah grew strong in faith by considering him faithful and by judging him faithful. And I told you that word in the Greek represents what you put first and foremost in your mind. She had looked back on his faithfulness. In the same sense, you would grow weak in faith by not judging him faithful, by not putting his faithfulness at the first and foremost point in your mind. We saw in Romans chapter 4 that her husband Abraham grew strong in faith because he considered his own body not dead and weak. He didn't meditate upon it. He didn't think about it. He didn't ponder it. He didn't make that his first and foremost point of meditation. He made the promise of God, his meditation, his focus, the thing he thought about. So what dominated their minds, Abraham and Sarah both, was the promise of the Father. For her, it was his faithfulness, looking back at all the things God had done, all, all the times he had come through for her and her husband. For Abraham, it was considering the promise that God would give them a child and that their descendants would be a sand on the seashore as the stars in heaven. That promise had come when both of them had passed the time of life where they could even have a child. It was naturally impossible. But they chose not to think about the impossibility. They chose to think about the promise of God. You might find yourself in a storm, friend where you see no way out. And your choice is to do what the disciples did and consider that storm, to meditate upon it, make it first and foremost in your mind, or to consider the Word of God. Now, some people have gone off into error when looking at these things. We're not talking about denying the storm exists. You never see any indication that Jesus denied that the storm was there. You don't see him indicating that he was any form of denial that the boat was sinking. From a natural perspective, we can look at this and think, how in the world can you be in a boat that is sinking with waves that are crashing over the edges of it, it's full of water, and be sound asleep? When you think about the situation Jesus was in, it absolutely amazes me, friend, because Jesus is in a boat full of water, which means... He was probably soaking wet with water all around him, but he sound asleep. He was so settled in the promise of the Father and the words that he received that they were going over to the other side that he was able to sleep in the midst of that storm. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, it says that he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is set on him. You see, there are no promises in Scripture that we won't face a storm. But there are promises that we can have peace in the midst of that storm. For the disciples, when faced with that child with a demon, it was their unbelief that stopped them from being able to cast out the demon. I've heard people say, well, if you just had enough faith, you would be able to, you know, cast out anything, clear a hospital, whatever. But, friend, you have to remember the power of unbelief. And the unbelief is fed by your focus. Let's go on and read some other things the Holy Spirit told us on June 21st. They were not preparing to cross that lake. They had allowed the corruptible seeds of doubt and despair to enter their souls, and they released the fruit of those seeds when they cried out to the Master, Carest not that we perish. Those words spoken in the midst of the storm are the fruit of the seeds they allowed the enemy to plant in their souls. 
They, talking about the disciples, were the sole determining factor on whether the seeds were allowed to take root. The fruits of their lips caused them to cry out to the master. The story that they were writing had been determined by the seeds within their soul. They were writing a story of death and destruction. The master, though, had written a story of success and victory when he released the fruit that came from the seed of the Father's word to him. You see, there was a choice in the words that they released. Proverbs 18.21 tells us that life and death is in the power of the tongue. They chose to speak words of death. They chose to meditate upon the storm. They chose to meditate upon the water filling the boat. They chose to meditate upon their natural tra training for those of them that had been professional fishermen and grew up, probably grew up on this lake. They had been in storms before. They had had experiences. What you choose to focus on, we're not promised to miss storm, that there won't be any storms, but we're promised that God will be faithful to bring us out to the other side victoriously. In Psalm chapter 23, it tells us that, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. How do you get to the point where you can walk without fearing the storm around you? By keeping your mind focused on him. Fear is fed from the things of this world. Fear is fed when we focus on the carnal realm. The five physical symptoms cry out the pain is real. And yes, it is real in our physical bodies do suffer. But we have a choice. Will we feed the spirit of fear by placing our primary point of attention, our focus, our meditation upon the symptoms? Or will we choose to feed the spirit of faith by feeding upon the Father's word? For it is the Father's word that feeds the spirit of fear, just as the words of the storm and the input of our five physical senses feed the spirit of fear. Fear or faith, the choice is ours. Yes, storms will arise, storms will abound. These are dark times to precede the master's return. But as he said, it would be in the just as in the days of Noah, so it will be today. But we can live above the storm. We can sleep in the hinder part of the ship just as the master. We can walk fear-free. But our point of focus, the things we look at, determine the output from within. That output can be the output of fear. That output can be the output of faith. For we have been given the measure of his faith. But it is our focus, the things we choose to look at, the things that we allow to dominate our soul, which determine the outlook that we take. Will we look to the words of the master? Will we consider them in the midst of the storm? No, he is not talking about denying that the storm exists, but it is simply resting as the master did in the hinder part of that ship, resting in the words of the father, knowing he is faithful. We can follow the example of Sarah, for in all of our lives we can look back and see the times he moved, the times he delivered, the times he healed. As we judge him faithful by keeping his faithfulness first and foremost in our souls, keeping that our dominant point of thought, we feed the spirit of faith. We feed that measure of faith. We activate it and grow in our ability to operate in it. The power will flow as the unbelief decreases. For perspective determines the end result. If our perspective is the perspective of the Father, we will emerge victoriously. For just as the psalmist said, he has set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Yes, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but victory is to be had for those who choose to sit and sup upon the bread of life. For did not the Master say, that he was the bread, that those who choose to eat his flesh and drink his blood would partake in his life, for he was the living word. We partake of him by partaking in the written word. As we choose to focus in on him and spend time allowing the Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, for it is in those quiet moments sitting alone with him 
that he will choose to teach and guide and reveal. He waits, he waits, but too many keep him waiting. In these times, we can rest in the midst of the storm. In these times, we can walk through to victory. But the manifestation is often withheld because a carnal mindset we have chosen to adopt. We look outward when we should be looking to him. We should look outward feeding the spirit of fear when we should be feeding the spirit of faith. But it is our perspective. It is our choice. For he has given us the tools. He has given us the authority. But it is our choice in the storm that will determine our victory. Friend, really the choice is up to us. What are we focusing in on? You know, many people talk about the fact that God is in control. What do they mean by that? If you look at it and honestly evaluate what they're saying, they are saying that they have no choice in the matter. Let me ask you a question. In Ephesians, Paul talks about the fact that the weapons of our, mar- our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to God for the pull- pulling down of strongholds. And I'm sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Why would God give us weapons to pull down strongholds if really our actions had no impact on our end result? If God were truly in control, then why did he give us those weapons? Those strongholds he's talking about, our thought processes and arguments within our soul, our mind, will, intellect, and emotion that come against the word of God. We see this in Romans, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. But if God were truly in control, then why would he place it in our hands to take every thought captive to the word of God? Everything the Spirit of God is showing us, everything we see in Jesus' answer to the disciples when they could not cast out that devil and that child, and free and free that little boy. We're seeing that God, that Jesus was telling them, just as God is telling us today, the Spirit of God is speaking to us. It is not that God is in control. It is that we are not making the right choices. You see, religious tradition holds so many people in bondage because tradition says, well, God is in control. Let me give you an example of how religious tradition can affect us, because what you have to understand is that just like Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, which we looked at in the previous program, a little leaven leavens the, the lump. Now, in Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 20, we have a familiar scripture. It tells us that it is according now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. If you hear most people quote this verse, that is where they stop. God is able to do abundantly above all we could ask or think. God is able to do abundantly above all we could ask or think. Well, then why is God not doing abundantly above all that so many people could ask or think? It is because we have made a tradition of quoting this verse, just parroting the words without meditating or considering or pondering what the verse actually says. Notice what it actually says as we read the whole verse. It actually says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You notice that God is only able to do abundantly above all that we could ask or think, when his power is working in us. When you look at this in the Greek, and he talks about, you know, according to the power working through us, that word according depicts a position of yieldedness. So God is hindered from doing above all that we could ask or think if we are not yielded to his power within us. In Romans chapter 8, and verse 11, it tells us that we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living within us. You have the power that raised Jesus from the dead inside of your spirit if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. But that power will not be released if you yield to the temptation to focus outward or to the input of your five physical senses. 
the things we focus on, the things we meditate upon, that's what the Holy Spirit is telling us. The reason so many people have so much unbelief is because their focus is outward. You know, we make it traditions we don't take time to read Scripture for ourselves. I can go into almost any church and quote the beginning part of this verse without adding in that according to the power that works within you. And people would be shouting and yelling amen because we've made it a tradition. This is why it is so important when you hear messages, when you hear, you know, a sermon at church or listen to a program like this one, that you take what you're hearing and go back to the Word and look at it for yourself. Make sure what you're hearing is the Word of God. Make sure that what you're hearing is being spoken by the, you know, through the anointing. And sometimes as you're going back and meditating, the Holy Spirit will expand what you've heard. I've had times where, you know, looking at Scripture and listening to a message and going back and listening and going back and listening to it, I started th seeing things that the minister had not even released. The Holy Spirit was sent to teach us. He uses teaching gifts or ministerial gifts like myself to do so. But ultimately, friend, he is the teacher. And our focus must be on him and in developing this relationship with him. When you talk about prayer, you're talking about fellowship. You're talking about relationship. What Jesus was telling the disciples was, this kind of unbelief does not come out, you know, through works, through your efforts, but instead by simply taking time aside, fasting to shut down your body, and to pray, to fellowship, to develop a relationship. And one thing that the Holy Spirit enjoys more than anything else is spending time with you while you meditate the Word, revealing Jesus to you through what you're looking at. He always works in line with the Word of God, friend. The truth and the temptation. Do you want to choose the truth, or do you want to choose the temptation? You see, in the sense that most people say it, God is not in control because he has get, put the choice in our hands. We choose what we are looking at. We choose what we're meditating upon. We choose what we're considering. We choose what we're thinking on the most. I understand that, you know, we have work assignments. We have family responsibilities. We have things to do throughout the day. But that doesn't mean you have to just totally shut God off. You have the person living in your spirit who knows everything about everything. I think about a situation recently I had at my job. We were putting together a deliverable for a client, and it was a spreadsheet with a lot of data in it. I had to collate that data and put it into a visual format in the form of a dashboard. But the formulas were outside of my experience to collate that data, and I was struggling with it. I Googled, and I looked at it and took some time to listen, but I just wasn't getting any answers. And then after a couple of days of this, one morning I woke up, and sometimes I wake up early, and I sat down with the Holy Spirit, and I just asked him, you know, as, as, com as I commonly do and as a habit of mine, I just asked him, what would you like to talk about today? And he answered me and said, I would like to talk about that spreadsheet you've been working on. And, you know, over the next 20 or so minutes, the Holy Spirit showed me several formulas. He showed me how to do, you know, an if-then statement with sub-formulas within them, sub-statements within them. Show me how to formulate it. And I went back and put it all together, and it worked. You see, he was interested in that because it was important to me. So I've heard people say, you could be too spiritually minded to be any earthly good. That is absolutely not the truth, because the more you renew your mind to the things of God, the more you renew your mind to the presence of the Holy Spirit within you, the more you develop that, pre that awareness of his presence. And that's what fasting does. It enables you to start increasing your awareness of him, shutting off the physical being. Jesus said this kind of unbelief. What was he talking about when he said that? Well, as you look at it, it you know, in, for our type, for our study, the type of unbelief that Jesus was talking about was the third type, but I've identified three specific types of unbelief 
within the New Testament scriptures. The first is a type of unbelief that results from a conscious decision to refuse to believe. It's somebody who's heard the message and has chosen consciously, I will not believe that thing that you are saying. The second type of unbelief is unbelief that, it re that results from ignorance of the things spoken. It is because you just don't know, so you do not believe because you do not have knowledge to enable you to believe. But then the third type of unbelief, which I believe is the type that Jesus was talking about, is the type of unbelief that results from placing your focus, your attention, your consideration in the wrong place. Because when you're looking outward instead of looking inward, you are causing your heart to become hardened to the voice of the Spirit. We will see in the next program that an instance where the disciples allowed their hearts to be hardened because they considered not the miraculous experiences they'd had. So too, friend, when we're not considering him, when we're not looking at it, you know, backwards at the things he has done, when we're not looking, as Sarah did, at his faithfulness and considering how faithful he has been, when we're not looking at the Word of God, when we're choosing instead to spend all of our free time looking at headlines, trying to keep up with things going on in the world, we're allowing our hearts to become hardened to the voice of the Spirit. And Jesus said the cure for that was to pray, which means to spend time in fellowship with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, and to fast. He didn't make it difficult. He didn't make it hard. He didn't create a formula or a seven-step list. Just simply fast and pray. Well, our time is up. And as I close out today, let me ask you once again, friend, if there's anything in your life that you would like us to come alongside and pray with you, please send us an email at prayer at mbmediaministries.net. Once we receive your email, we will jump on it, we will begin to pray, and we will stand with you to victory. But as we close out today, let me remind you once again that you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.